Good morning, everyone. So last week we looked at sin, and we didn't even scratch the surface. Of all the things that I had planned to go through, I got through about half of it, and as I was preparing, I said to myself, if you don't get through these things, you haven't even scratched the surface, and we didn't. So, oh well, it's out on the internet now for good or ill, but it's not a very, it's not a very thorough treatment. And I preface our discussion today on death uh, with that because we're going to barely even touch it. And that's just all we can do in the time we have. But nonetheless, uh, it's a more interesting topic, death that is, than might be immediately apparent. Particularly if you're used to thinking of death as, well, what happens to you at the end of life. If that's most or all, all of what it is to you, then prepare to be amazed. No, <laughs> But the first thing we're up against is something we all realize, and that's the culture that we're in, the people we bump elbows with throughout the week, really have a very different worldview than ours, and particularly when it comes to death. Death is one of those rubber-hits-the-road moments where you see that all human beings, whether they've been to seminary or not, whether they're Christian or not, are theologians. When death comes, you hear the theology of an individual person or group of people, uh, whatever that theology may be. So death is a theological litmus test in some ways, how it's handled, what's said about it. In uh, our worldview today, unless you disagree with me, I, and of course raise your hand and uh, let me know and we can discuss it, because I'd love to explore this idea further, but I believe that we would mostly agree that the worldview in which we live is that death is natural. Death is natural. It's simply a part of life. And I was indoctrinated by Disney movies growing up where mom and dad, king and queen die, and there's a few tears shed, and at the end, though, everyone lives happily ever after. Now, mom and dad are either nowhere to be found, which is sort of a weird way of treating death. They're dead and gone, we cry a few tears, we move on, live happily ever after, even though death has struck those near and dear to us. Or, more common, mom and dad or whoever are up there watching over us. Right? That's a very common theme. And I'm picking on Disney, but of course, it's a very common theme in... uh, Cartoon movies and movies, children's fiction, adult fiction. The loved one is somewhere up there watching over us. Which is really a glimpse into the multiple personality disorder of our culture. Because on the one hand, our culture by and large holds to an evolutionary worldview. A worldview in which death is part of nature because it's part of evolution. So the idea that mom and dad are up there, wherever up there is, watching over us, is a lie. From the materialistic standpoint, or from the Christian standpoint. So, death we see is treated in a way of, uh, really in a way that's frankly insanity, at a societal level. Where we tell ourselves all sorts of things that we don't actually believe and practice. We base our whole worldview on an evolutionary, materialistic worldview, and then in the face of death, we all become raving mystics. So then, uh, to go back to Disney movies for a moment, not only is death okay or not that big of a deal, you can live happily ever after, even though it strikes, or we believe the lie that well, mom and dad or whoever it is are up there looking down on us, smiling upon us. We can go one step further to the Lion King, the circle of life, where the circle of life is really brought about in the context of what? Death. Yeah, death. That's what the circle of life is, completely misnamed. Isn't it rather the circle of death? Yeah where 
the eater of today becomes the eated of tomorrow. <laughs> All right, so, you know, the lion gets his zebra, lion dies, bird gets the lion, and so forth. Around and around it goes. Now, the insanity of the Lion King is that the animals who live this circle of death are singing about it, calling it the circle of life, and are they displeased in the least? No, for crying out loud, there's zebras and lions and buzzards and every part of the circle of death all just singing about how great it is. It is utter madness. It will drop your jaw. And that's what I would propose to you is ultimately where our society goes with the concept of death, right into this madness. In uh, 1969, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote a book called On Death and Dying, and she proposed five stages of grief. She had in view uh, the individual as you move through the grieving process. What I want to do is introduce that to you and then suggest that that's become our society's approach toward death or, or an accurate observation of our society's approach to death with one caveat. Her five stages of grief are denial, that's stage one, anger, stage two, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So in the face of Death, that's our process. Okay. Now, I would say societally or universally, um, this, is a, this is a true observation, but it's true of our society as well as for each one of us individually in terms of how we look at uh, death. Now, I'm going to say it's a fairly accurate or true representation of how we are, but I'm also going to say it's wrong in so many ways. So in the first place, denial as an approach to death. Have you ever been 18? <laughs> I used to ride around. Yeah, when <laughs> I used to ride around when I was 16, 17, 18. Uh, yesterday without a <laughs> without a seatbelt on. The older I get, the more insane I find that. Be, not only because of the statistics and because you learn, but because you something changes in the perception of your head and your body and you realize the forces at work here are such that they will crumple me instantaneously. My arms will not be able to keep me from the dash or the window or anything else. But when you're 16, 17, 18, and you got your sleeves rolled up and your hat on backwards, you don't feel that way, you don't think that way. And that is societally one of our great approaches to death, is to simply deny it, pretend it's not there, or pretend that we have control over it. Now that comes with the illusion that we're going to live forever. Now no one actually believes that, at least I hope not, we're all adults. And yet that is actually what we believe because that's actually what we practice. That's the insanity in which we live as these fallen human beings. We know better in our minds, and yet in our hearts we live completely contrary to that. And think about the goals you have, the purchases you want to make. Think about your home and the things you collect, your hobbies and the things you've placed together. Right? We look at these things, we view these things, we build these things as if we were going to live forever. As if they're always going to be there. So I would argue that to one extent or another, we all live in a denial of death. So when the Bible comes and talks about death, 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 or a good preacher who's reflecting the Bible comes and talks about death, 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 it strikes our ears as, well, technically true, but a little over the top, because it's nothing I have to worry about now. Phase two would be anger. And I think we find this uh, in ourselves more in uh, adulthood. That is, when we stand at the grave of a loved one and we realize that the God that we've believed in 
uh, and the circle of life and the goodness and the sunshine and the smiling flowers and everything else um, don't really matter anymore. And many people become, uh, I wouldn't say they go so far as to be graveside atheists, but functionally graveside atheists. And you can see that in the raw and bitter pain of one who has just lost a loved one and the things that they say as they uh, indict God and as they justify the individual who lived and died. Um, and that justification itself is an indictment over against God. How do I mean? I mean, for example, when a grieving mother says of her son, who was a known gang member who died in the middle of committing a crime, he was a good person. Why did God take him? He did this, and he was that way, and his friends loved him, and his siblings look up, looked up to him. Now, think theologically. Defending why this person ought not be subject to death, and yet they were subjected to death, is accusing God of being unjust and afflicting death. Anger. Anger at God. Even if it's not recognized. Anger at God. Three would be bargaining, which in its old form, and, and again, just to refocus us, for those who came in, societally how we look at death. Bargaining. And the old form of bargaining against death is religion. That's it. How do we bargain with God or gods? How do we get this person to either live longer, live happily, you know, live more happy, or uh, if they are dead, how do we make them more comfortable in death or better off in death or get through the bad parts to the better parts faster? Religion is the way of bargaining. Now in the new form, it's medicine and science. And I think that that's what we find in our culture as the bargaining response to death. Any of you watch the TV show House? I was addicted to it when it was on. I loved it. I thought it was great in so many ways. But one of the things that I found in myself as I was reflecting on it, what I love is the idea that somewhere in some big city, in some big hospital, are a team of doctors surrounding one particularly brilliant doctor who could cure me of anything. And you laugh because in a vacuum it sounds so stupid, and yet outside of a vacuum in our everyday thinking, we very often think that medicine works exactly that way. And we very often treat our doctors, uh, not that they would encourage this, but to view them as gods. And that, uh, you know, a good, a good doctor knows better. <laughs> but bad doctors don't. <laughs> and, uh, and people who are scared to death of death, we have our defenses lined up against it in the form of bargaining. And the bargaining hits us at the root level where we might not even be willing to admit it. If I eat enough leafy greens, <laughs> if I take the right vitamins, if I change my diet, if I adopt this uh, workout plan or the other, if I get my checkups all in time, you see, we're bargaining against death. Now, I'm not saying <laughs> stop doing all that. But I'm saying realize as you do it what the root is. The root is you don't want to die. Neither does anyone else. It's a reaction against death. If you didn't have to worry about death, would you eat all that crappy food? <laughs> so again, it's not, to, it's not to say stop doing that. It's to say realize why you're doing it and realize why everyone else is doing it. Okay, then there's depression which manifests itself societally as we look at death in two forms, I think, and I'm not alone in this, uh, indifference and distraction. These two things can be wed together or made distinct, but the whole idea is, well, this world is what it is. 
we're all going to die sometime. I may as well be indifferent and live for myself. I may as well distract myself with pleasure if there's no point at all, if we're all going to die, and I don't know if I'm going to die tomorrow or the next day, and if I uh, work really hard, save up for retirement, I might die the day before, so why bother? And uh, why not? Why not just live a life in front of the TV or the computer or the phone? Why not? We're all going to die. You spend your time how you want it. Don't judge me. I'll spend the time how I want it. Or if we're all, if we're, or if we're all going to die, then why not live a little recklessly? Why not sleep with who I want to sleep with? Drink as much as I want to drink. Have a good time. Okay. So depression is also in the form. It takes the form, I think, in our culture of indifference. I could care less about you people or this world or human life. And distraction. What do I care about instead? My joys, my hobbies, what I can get, what I can need, what, what I need, um, what can bring me joy. Okay, and then fifth would be acceptance. Simply saying that do- where, really where we began, dying is part of life. And since dying is part of life, it then presents to us no crisis at all, or it ought not. That's what acceptance is. I just accept it the way it is. I come to terms with it. I'm no longer in crisis. I'm no longer in conflict with it. I accept it. Here's where I then deviate and add a sixth step to the Kubler-Ross paradigm, viewing our society's response to death. And that's that in our culture, acceptance moves beyond acceptance to celebration. So that death is celebrated. This one of the recent popes, I think he coined the term, is our culture of death. In the culture of death, death is viewed as a positive thing, not as really even death at all. Rather, death is a journeying on or a positive transformation. Here's a poem that encapsulates all of this, and probably you've heard it, and probably you've heard it at a Christian funeral. Mary Elizabeth Fry. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift, uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. Now you say to yourself, how on earth could either a Christian or someone who believes in a materialistic or evolutionary worldview ever believed these things. They couldn't. But in the face of death, we become insane. And ultimately, that insanity goes not only to accepting death, but to celebrating it. So that it's not a time to stand at my grave and weep, but it's a time to celebrate my death. Now, we call it a celebration of life because we're very good at calling things what they aren't. But it's a celebration of death and all that led up to it. Okay? So look, I am not here, the final line. I did not die. Death is viewed so positively that it's not viewed as death at all, but rather as a journeying on or as a positive transformation. In this case, she is no longer a human being. She's the glints on snow and whatnot. Since death is such a positive thing and something to be celebrated, then we view it, we begin to view it societally as a great tool. And as a, and as a thing without consequence or with positive consequence. Such that euthanasia, right? When someone is suffering too much or when someone is no longer of use, 
If we put them to death, it's indifferent or maybe even good. Or assisted suicide, if I get to the point where my life is just too much for me, it's indifferent if I die or maybe even a positive thing. So death is celebrated. Death is celebrated, of course, in the practice of abortion, where what we tell ourselves we're celebrating is freedom, right? Pro-choice, to choose. When what we are actually celebrating is death, because through the death of that child we gain what we perceive as freedom, freedom to serve our real gods. And what are the two gods in our country? That's one. Sex. Sex and money. So we use death in service of sex and money. What is the single thing that gets most in the way of sex and money? Children. <laughs> you don't think so, Concordia kids? Have one. <laughs> so death becomes celebrated as a tool and as a means and an instrument through which we can then use it in worship of our true gods. Death is also then celebrated in popular culture. It's no longer viewed as a horrifying thing or as a terrible thing or as a great evil or as a great mystery, but rather it's seen as fascinating and enjoyable entertainment. Crime shows, zombie shows, apocalyptic shows, vampire shows. Just turn on the TV and watch a show and see how often, how frequently death pops up and how it's treated. We treat death as entertainment. If death is entertainment, then death is certainly being viewed as something positive and fun. So, death is not only natural in our culture, it's to be embraced and used. In other words, death is good. The Bible begs to differ, presents an alternative worldview, as you well know. As the Bible presents death, the Bible presents it, first of all, as certainly not good, and second of all, also as not natural. Which strikes us at first as a bizarre thought, until we reorient ourselves within the biblical worldview, Simply this, that God created human beings in his own image and breathed into their nostrils the breath of life and never intended for them to die, for us to die, ever. Death was not part of his plan. Into the garden he placed a tree, and upon it he placed his word, and the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Death would come if they ate of that tree, and death would come as a what? Consequence, punishment, curse. Oh. I mean, if mom says, don't do this or this will happen, and you do it, and that happens, that's a consequence, a punishment. So death is a punishment. Which is to say, from our perspective, then, death is most certainly bad, because death is wrath. It's God's wrath. Death is punishment. It's God's punishment. Death is the Creator's no to each one of us. And that's why at the grave of another, we become so defensive. And our mouths and our minds fill with eulogies. Why? God has said no, and by eulogizing, we want to say what? Yes. Yes to this person's existence. Yes to who they were. Let me tell you all about them and why it should be yes. That's a eulogy. But God has said no. If I die and you're all, any of you are at my funeral, if anyone eulogizes, tackle them. <laughs> tackle them. 
I grant you preemptive absolution. <laughs> that or else I just might get up out of the coffin myself and scare everyone to death. God willing, God willing. <clears throat> okay. Death is bad. Death is wrath. Death is punishment. Death is the Creator's no. And that's so obvious to us that we... This is the theology of Ecclesiastes, isn't it? We can't actually look at the thing for what it is and say what it is. We have to lie and call it the complete opposite and do the complete opposite. So death is not a positive transformation. And the thing itself will tell you that if you just open your eyes. There's nothing pretty about a person dying on a bed. There's nothing pretty about a person who's been in an accident and they're scattered all over the road. There's nothing pretty about popping a coffin open. Not even the best of morticians can make your loved one pretty. Death is not a positive transformation. It was the ancient Gnostics that believed that it was, in this way, that you are free from your body, you are free from the material which is bad. So-called Christian Gnostics picked this idea up, uh, Marcion. The God of the Old Testament is the one who created your body. He's also the one that, you know, commanded the genocide of all those people. The God of the Old Testament is really kind of a jerk. The God of the New Testament is the one who gives you your soul and redeems you, and death is his gift so that you are finally free from the cage of your body and can float around without your body for all eternity. Now that Gnosticism has re-emerged in Christianity. It's... Uh, Shoot, what's his name? It'll come to me in a minute. Who's the Anglican Archbishop? No, no, no. Um, ah. Anyway, he says this. He says, when you look at the headstones from the 18th century, uh, when you look at the headstones from the 18th century and pre earlier, what you see in Latin is the word... Uh, Basically, for it's shorthand for resurrection or I'll be back. Now, a shift happens around the 18th and 19th centuries, and Christian tombs no longer say, I will rise, I will be back. They start saying more like, heaven is my home. What's different about that? Seemingly nothing on the surface, everything if you dig two inches into it, because one is professing the resurrection of the body, that this material, that this body is good, and that it's this world that I'm coming back to, and it's this world that's going to be made new. That's the first confession. The second confession is, I'm gone, I'm out of here, see you suckers later. I'll never see my body again. I'll never see this place again. And good riddance. What am I going to do? Go float around as a lobotomized spirit in heaven, bumping into people that I may or may not know, maybe becoming someone entirely different, etc. All of that is pagan Gnosticism, but it presents itself today as Christianity. And you can discover this for yourself if you get out a, a good Bible and look through the Bible index and you look for all the references to what the afterlife in heaven is going to be like. You'll find something like that. And then you look at references that talk about the resurrection of the body, or refer to it. We looked at that a few weeks ago. Or the new heavens and the new earth, and you'll find something more like that. Our emphasis uh, within the Christian church for 2,000 years is unanimously and adamantly the resurrection of the body and the new heavens and the new earth. And now in these Later days, that's shifted. Okay. Shifting that allows us to view death as a positive thing in a way that isn't accurate or true. As if you're free from your body and that's a good thing. 
What, what, is, what is put in the coffin, what is put in the ground is not you. Oh, it most certainly is. Oh, it most certainly is. Now, it's not your soul, but it is your body, and God created you as soul and body. Right? To be other than that is a punishment, is an affliction. Death is just that. It's the separation of the soul from the body. At least that's what we describe as temporal death. Now, death actually has a threefold nature to it. If you recall back in Genesis where God says to Adam and Eve, or at least to Adam, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, they ate of it, and in that day did they die. <laughs> right. No, they didn't die in the sense that their spirit and body were sundered and into the ground their body went and off wherever their soul went. They didn't die in that way, but yes, they did die spiritually. As Paul says, dead in our trespasses. Dead in our trespasses. Dead to God. Spiritually dead. That's what happens. So all around us are people who are spiritually dead. What God does with his word is raises us from the dead. You know that part in Ezekiel with the valley of dry bones and prophesy, son of man, and the son of man prophesies, and the bones stand up and sinew wraps around and they're raised from the dead? The whole point of that dialogue is that we are all already dead. And the word of God comes and speaks to us, and we who are dead rise to new life. We are raised even now in Christ Jesus, right? So we are, by nature, spiritually dead, and we live in a world that's full of spiritually dead people. So if you've seen the movie The Sixth Sense, no? Wow, this is going to fall. I see dead people. <laughs> yeah, you can like go to the mall and say that. <laughs> I mean, well, okay, that's a little morbid. But we're all spiritually dead. We're all dead in our trespasses. And we're made alive by Christ Jesus. He teaches the same thing, and it's recorded for us in the Gospel of John, his take on it, how he speaks and people uh, rise in him. Okay, So look, we are spiritually dead. That's one aspect of death. The second aspect of death we've talked about is the physical death that happens at the end of life, which is really just the conclusion of the spiritual death. The spiritual death is the main thing, right? I mean, if you weren't spiritually dead, you wouldn't die. So you can say, uh, gosh, you know, Pastor Rody, he died so young. Why did he die? Ah, it was such and such a disease. No, it wasn't. There was one reason why I died. One. Can you name it? Sin. That's it. That was the cause of death. I would be the world's most boring coroner. <laughs> cause of death, another one, sin. <laughs> okay, so physical death is just, and that mangling that happens of our beings, you know, God takes the clay and he breathes into it the breath of life, and behold, a nefesh, a living being, that's what's cut in half in death. It's an ugly, brutal, nasty thing. It's a destruction. It's a negative transformation. I mean, even if it goes well for your soul, I'm half the man I used to be is quite literal. <laughs> All right, and then third, the final conclusion of being separated from your body and soul, first separated from God spiritually, then separated from yourself and from this plane of reality where you belong, is what we call eternal death. And that is, uh, in so many words, existing in a state of perpetual death. I can't imagine what that's like. Well, you kind of can. <laughs> and what I mean by this is, you, you and I, we live right now a living death. That's our state as Christians. We are uh, simul justus et peccator, right? At the same time sinner and saint, and at the same time we are dead man walking, <laughs> dead men walking, and yet we are alive in Christ. 
So we have that duality of being both fully alive and fully dead. And from that we can glimpse, imagine a state of existence in which it was only and ever death. Now thinking this way allows us to view death more accurately and also more three-dimensionally. One way to think about it or visualize it is that death that we're all afraid of that happens at the end of this life, whenever that may be. We like in our minds to isolate that off. All of us. But in reality, that death at the end of our lives is much more like a giant octopus or kraken that sends its tentacles back in time and starts to wrap itself all around you long before you even fall into its mouth. What do those tentacles look like of death when they wrap themselves around you? Possibly an illness? Aging. Aging. Yeah. My hair's... Where's it going? My eyesight. I've got contacts popped in there. Right? I get a cut. Now, it takes me days, maybe even weeks to heal. When I was a kid, it was like, you know, done. Aging. So our bodies decay. And that is nothing but death. If you go with the previous imagery, the tentacles of death wrapping around us already. We sing... uh In the hymn, I think it's Abide With Me. Death and decay and all around I see. If you train your eye to see this, it's really distracting. You can hardly hold a conversation with someone. Because you start to see, and you do it to yourself in the mirror, but you start to see death wrapped all over them. Now, don't do this with your spouse. (laughs) What are you staring at, Jeremy? Nothing. No, really? What are you staring? You've just got some death wrapped around your eyes right here. I, not a good idea. Not a good idea. But you know where this can, where this can drive you wild in a, in a sort of way is when you see it wrapping itself around the people you love and transforming them. And you can see like you're, oh gosh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to get choked up. You can see it on your parents, you know, increasingly, and it's just rotten. It's just rotten. So death, uh, as opposed from this, you know, as opposed to being this thing at the end of life, it's all neat and tidy and, you know, uh, death instead is something that's really a very present reality. And it's already saying, I got you. And it's already saying, you're in my tentacles. And it's ever wrapping them tighter. It's ever more fully writing itself into us in uh, body and soul and mind and all parts we have. And you can see it in yourself and you can see it, see it in others. We call it aging or whatever, but let's just call it what it is. It's death. It's kind of a funny statement, you know. How old is that guy anyway? Oh, he's older than God. Oh. <laughs> but, but the truth is, if you think about it, God isn't old at all. Because old is simply being subject to death. God hasn't aged a day. God is the youngest being in all that's ever been. I mean, not also because he's outside of time and space, but that, that aside, okay? Um, you know, the bottom line is we are all older than God. Because age is just decay. At least that's how it is here. All right, so death becomes something that is very personal and very real and not something that we can put off to the end of life, something we have to deal with now, and deal with it we do. Plastic surgery. Right? Dyeing my hair. I can't wear glasses. People will see my death. I need contacts. So I have them in. Right? That is the nature of then what we do is we want to hide death from ourselves and from other people. And uh, what we also find, if we're honest, is the medicine cabinet starts to fill up. When I was 18, when I was 20, when I was 25, when I was 30, I didn't take any medicine. <laughs> what do I need pills? What do I, what do I need vitamins for? No? 
All the vitamins I needed then, I got in beer. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure of it. So, you're living on borrowed time, <laughs> to say the least. But, you know, as the older you get, the more the pill cabinet fills up, and the more pills you find yourself swallowing every day. Right? Simply, death preaches to us a thousand sermons in any given day. Every single person. And this is one of the reasons why Paul can say, Oh, you, ma you know, oh, you, uh, you man, you sinner, you're without excuse. Because whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, you are without excuse. Every darn day, death preaches a thousand sermons to you, preaches to you of your mortality. And when Christ comes and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, no, I don't need that. I'm not going to die for a while. Maybe, maybe at the end. So, as life, and as the one who has conquered death in his body, raised from the dead, this is the thing that we have to keep in mind as Christians. This is the glorious blessing and benefit that God has given us in Christ. As close to us as death is. I don't mean death at the end of, the, end of life. I mean death with all its tentacles. Christ himself is the Lord of death and the conqueror of death, and he is there. Now you have to have his gospel preached into your ears, but then look, this is how death, with all its tentacles, becomes your servant. Because if you let it, it's constantly preaching what you don't have, and by way of negative space, sort of that idea of painting a portrait, sort of that idea of Ecclesiastes, by way of negative space, the death that wraps around you, ends up preaching Christ. That negative space that is filled in by knowledge of the gospel. Right? As Jesus says, as he's praying to the Father in earshot of his disciples, this is eternal life. This is eternal life. To know you and the one whom you have sent. So where death is, when we know God and the one whom he has sent, when we know Christ, when we are reminded of death, we remind ourselves immediately of Christ. As present as death is to us, Christ is there present for us. That's our comfort. That's our strength. Okay. Now this means... Uh, well, I suppose let's backtrack for just a second because we're assuming that God's on our side in this whole thing. But have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought of the tension there? We began by saying, uh, th this leg of the conversation, by saying God is the one who punishes, God is the one who afflicts us with death. And that's true, the Bible says as much. For example, First uh, Samuel 2.6, the Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. So even the Bible itself tells us God is the one who afflicts us with death. So then, is death God's enemy? No, oh, death is God's servant. Um, as, as David, you pointed out um, last week, that, that place in Hosea, I think it's chapter 13, where God is calling upon death. Right? Oh, death, where are you? Where is your sting? And he's calling upon it as his servant to afflict the people. Death isn't God's enemy. But... When God becomes man, as one born under the law, as one born under the curse, in other words, in the person of Jesus, in the flesh of Jesus, now death is God's enemy. And as we're told in Hebrews specifically, Jesus has come, God has come in the flesh in order to destroy the one who has the power of death. So in God incarnate, God in the flesh of Jesus, in doing that, God makes death his enemy. And that's the great paradox. According to the law, according to the nature of sin, death is God's servant. But in Christ, death becomes God's enemy. Thus, Paul takes up that same imagery of Hosea, calling on death, calling on Hades, and now he says, where is your sting? Not bring it here, but where is it? It's gone. Christ has put it away. Where is your victory? It's gone. Christ has risen. 
He's victorious over you. So the whole nature of death changes when Christ becomes man, or when God becomes man in Christ. Now death is God's enemy. Okay, we see this. Uh, and if death is God's enemy, then it's Jesus' mission, as you know, as we see from the scriptures, to come and put away sin and destroy the power of death. And only then, if we are in Christ, do we see death as an enemy and as an enemy overcome, overcome by the very God who afflicts us with it. And only in this view and in light of the resurrection are we bold to say with Paul, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's an entirely different way than the pagans mean it. It's an entirely different way than the gal who wrote the poem about becoming the glints on the snow. To die is gain because we are in the one who we are in the one in Christ who will put away death, who's conquered it already and will put it away. Okay, so let's talk for a few minutes about a good death. Uh, what is a good death? In your sleep, no pain, semi truck, 80 miles an hour and 80 miles an hour. Killed on impact. Didn't even know what happened. One minute I'm rocking out to Metallica, the next minute I'm in heaven. That is a good death, is it not? That's how we all view it. Quick, painless, easy. That's not how Christians have viewed it throughout the centuries. A good death, now again, the way you die, you don't get a lot of say in the matter, usually. Okay, So it's not about like, you know, oh, that was a bad death. Mm, mm. You know, or as if you'd put on your resume, you know, died a good death. Got that one. No, a good death was simply one that a person is prepared for. So that whether it comes upon you suddenly or not, a good death is a death that one is well prepared for. Nothing worse, a bad death, if you will. Maybe bad's the wrong word because it's doesn't it's not a great translation. Maybe the idea there is one that catches you unawares, sneaks up and grabs you. Here you were, you were you were going along, you're trying to get all this stuff done, you were completely unaware of it, and it snatched you away in the blink of an eye, and you're disoriented, and what happened? That would be a bad death. A good death is that in all things you are mindful of, of its presence, you are mindful of the presence of your Lord Jesus. You are prepared for death. How does one prepare for death? Better have a will and a trust, and all, okay, well, yeah, fine. I'm not going to say don't do that, but that would be barely scratching the surface. To prepare for death, uh, we have a fascinating tradition in, in our Lutheran tradition, and that's this. Remember in Romans 6 where Paul says, if you are baptized, then you are united with Christ in a death like his and also in a resurrection like his. So to prepare for death, if we think about death and resurrection, we're thinking baptismally, according to Paul. So one prepares for death by being baptized and then by remembering that baptism, even on a daily basis. And here's the way Luther looked at it. When you wake up every morning, you make the sign of the cross upon you, Remembering your baptism, that you are clothed in Christ, as Paul says, Galatians 3.27. So you are counting yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. All right? Luther's words, baptism indicates that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. In other words, to prepare for death is a daily activity where the old Adam in you is daily being drowned and put to death, and the new Adam, the new man in you, is being daily raised up by Christ to live in purity and righteousness before him. So every day, baptismally, we practice death. And the whole idea of this is you line it up with day and morning. Every night, you die. 
And though we think we wake ourselves up, we actually don't. Right? Have you ever thought about that? So when we wake in the morning, who is it that wakes us? It's God, and we wake and rise. God has written it into the very essence of creation that we practice death and resurrection every day. When we rise, we remember that we are in baptism, we are put to death with Christ and raised with Christ every day, every day. Beautiful theology of the day I don't have time to get into, but uh, the, the ultimate goal of this practice is simply this. When it's time for you to die, you go to the grave as if you were going to your bed. Because all this time you've gone to your bed as if going to your, to your grave. So that line from the hymn, that we fear the grave as little as our bed. Right? Because we know that if we die, he will wake us up. Remember what Jesus says. Uh, they come to him and they say that, you know, the little girl, she's, she's dead. Jesus said he's sleeping. And they all said, oh yeah, we believe you. No, they all laughed him to scorn. And then what did he do? He went up into that room and he said, wake up. And she did. So death is but a sleep. Our Lord teaches that himself. All right, we also practice judgment every Sunday. We go to communion as if going to judgment. So when we go to judgment, it's as if going to communion. And why do we say that? In communion, who are, or in, excuse me, in judgment, who are you going to meet? Jesus. A different Jesus from the one you meet when you go to communion? No, the same. Yeah. yeah say, on judgment days, I can say, <clears throat> and who are you? Mm hmm, and nice to meet you. You can say, welcome. I see you're here again. So, in judgment, we face the same Christ we face in the Lord's Supper every Sunday. And every Sunday in the Lord's Supper, what does he say to you? For you, for the forgiveness of your sins, is forgiveness. So we go to communion, right, as if to judgment, so that when we go to judgment, it's as if going to communion. Now, that's perfect love that casts out all fear, is it not? You know, it's judgment day. Honestly, that the thought of that makes me freak out. Okay? It's judgment day. You're going to meet your Lord. Oh, the same Lord I met earlier today at the communion rail? That's the same one. I'm not frightened. I want to go. Let's get there. So that's the practice of death, dying, and rising every day, and the practice of judgment every week. Maybe someday I'll do a theology of the day and a theology of the week. So a good death is a death in which we confess against death. We have that opportunity. We're prepared. We witness to our loved ones. You know, Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And it's this bizarre thing I've realized as Christians, after the image of Christ, we're given the very same thing. When you die... You don't draw all men to yourself, but you draw your men to yourself. That is, your whole family gathers around you. What are they here? As a Christian, let's assume you've got a pastor that's preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of Christ, Christ crucified. Let's assume that. Then just like your master who dies and draws all men to yourself, when you die, you draw your family to yourself, and there they hear the gospel. There they hear the words of Christ. That's a good death. So to prepare for that, to have a good church and a good pastor ready to proclaim that, and to speak that to your, to your family. These are all what Christians have throughout the centuries considered to be a good death. And again, we're just scratching the surface on that concept, but it's very alien to us today. We don't often hear about this. Hey, I'm, I'm over time. Let me just go one minute longer, because I want to take issue with the Kubler-Ross uh, five stages of grieving. Um, in the first place, I actually think you don't progress through the stages. It's a personal opinion. I think you're all the stages at once in varying degrees, sometimes mixed together, sometimes distinct. But the day you get over your anger that your loved one is gone, something inside of you has died, and it was something important. The one I particularly take issue with is uh, the, uh, the acceptance part of death. Um, that being the fifth stage of grief. What that betrays, in my opinion, is a complete misunderstanding of what grief actually is. The church and our theologians have rather observed this, that grief is simply what we call loving 
a person who is absent. When you love someone who is absent, when you love someone who is with the Lord, you're grieving. You're grieving. So in that sense, we don't ever move to this point like Kubler-Ross says where, oh, we've accepted it, we no longer grieve. Bull, loney, hogwash. We always grieve because we always love. And on the last day, we're going to see in the resurrection the actual concrete answer. We're going to actually see Grandpa back and Grandma back Mom and dad and son and daughter and spouse, family and friends. We're going to see them back and we're going to see them back alive. So we don't need to come to terms with and accept this. We continue to love them though they are absent. We mourn for them and yet as Paul says, we mourn as those who have hope. He puts it in the negative. We mourn but not as those who have no hope. But to put that in the positive, we mourn because we have hope, and our hope is in Christ Jesus, and death will be undone. You love those who are absent, and so you mourn, and you always will. But there is an answer in Christ Jesus, and that answer is, wait just a little while longer. Every Sunday we confess, I believe in the resurrection of the dead, and we're not just talking about Jesus. He's the first fruits. So as uh, Jesus is risen, and as Job says, we shall see him with our own eyes, so also all who die in Christ will rise, and we shall see them with our eyes. And more, we'll wrap our arms, these arms, though not corruptible, but now incorruptible, around our loved ones in their bodies, no longer corruptible, but now incorruptible, and death will have no more dominion. Death will be undone forever. The Lord be with you.